Hey there, I'm excited to announce this to you today. This is what you've been waiting for in your spiritual quest. This is something I've wanted to do for a long time, and I'm finally ready to announce it that it's ready to go. It's the Grief to Growth Community Circle. Now, this is a sanctuary where like-minded souls are united in their journey through grief and towards personal transformation. It's more than just a place. It's a beginning. It's a commitment to growth and understanding. Here you're finding not just a community, but you're entering a circle of trust and depth. You're going to engage with interactive coursework. You'll dive into exclusive podcast episodes and partake in discussions that illuminate the path from mourning to empowerment. This is a realm where every question is honored and every individual's journey is validated. To be part of this exclusive circle, visit us at grieftogrowth.com slash community or look for the chat icon at the bottom of every page on the main website. Remember that entry is a privilege because I want to ensure that every member is as dedicated and genuine as you are. You must apply to join, but the journey within is worth every step. So go ahead and join us today. Check it out, grieftogrowth.com slash community, and I look forward to seeing you there. Hi there. Welcome to Grief to Growth Podcast. Your host is Brian Smith, spiritual seeker, best-selling author, grief survivor, and life coach. Brian believes that the worst tragedies of life provide the greatest opportunity for growth. Brian says he was planted, not buried, and he is here to help you grow where you've been planted by the difficulties in life. In each episode, Brian and his guests will share what has helped them to survive and thrive. It is his sincere hope this episode helps you today. All right. Hi, this is Brian Smith back with the special episode of Grief to Growth. And today I've got with me Donna Sebo, uh, who is an international radio host. I'm going to read out Donna's introduction and then we'll have a conversation like we always do. Uh, Donna lives in the evergreen state of Washington. On a clear day, she can actually see Mount Rainier uh, and living in the South, South Sound area enables her to enjoy the richness of the environment around her, which supports the invigorating, refreshing energy that she applies to her work. Um, Donna's gotten into this work in her 20s due to a series of paranormal experiences that we had that we'll ask her about. Um, Donna is the host of the Donna Sebo Show, which was developed on Delphi Vision International Broadcasting, and which now streams programming to over 128 countries worldwide. And that's on, I believe, I'll ask Donna, but I believe it's on 8 p.m. Uh, Pacific time every day, uh, every weekday. So with that, I want to introduce uh, and welcome Donna Sebo to the show. Brian, thank you so much for having me as a guest. This is an absolute delight. I appreciate this. Donna, you know, it's really great to have you on. I was on your show a couple of weeks ago. We had a really uh, interesting conversation where you were, uh, you talked to me about my book and the work that I'm doing. So today I want to talk to you about your life and the work that you're doing. So maybe we could start. You could tell me, how did you get started? with What were the paranormal experiences that you had that kind of set you on this path? Life has a, so many twists and turns in it, and when I look back on that time in my life, I was in my early 20s, and I had had a very, I would say, a difficult path that I had walked, and it was because of choices that I was making, and I can't say that it was horrifically bad in the true sense. After interviewing the thousands of people I have, I realized that maybe my experiences were not all that bad, but I was living in a space of, what do I want to say? How do I want to describe it? It it was a space of immaturity. It was a space of denial. Hmm. It was a space of being in a marriage that I should not have gone into. And I started having these dreams. And to me, they were nightmares. In fact, I can even now recall very vividly awakening one morning, and I was just dripping in perspiration. Mm -hmm. At the time, I was living in Southern California. I'm a Southern California girl, and I had this awareness from the dream that something was very wrong. Now, in my interpretation, when you're young, you think usually the worst of the worst. And I really felt my life was in danger. I was in a very unhealthy space in my marriage. And I said to myself, I've got to ask for help. Mm -hmm. I'm a very private person. And when I was young, especially since I was taught 
you don't tell other people your business and you don't ask for help. Well, mm-hmm. what I did was exactly the opposite of that. I felt I needed to ask for help. And I have a very, very dear friend, even today, who at that time in my life, she was in another community. But I picked up the phone and I called her and I said, I'm having these horrible nightmares and I'm scared. Do you know how to interpret dreams? And she said, I haven't a clue. So the conversation as it went on, she then at the end of what I shared with her about the dream, she said, Donna, I don't know what I can do here. She said, I can't do anything because I don't know anything about dream interpretation. However, what I can do is tell you I've got a new sister-in-law, and her name is Tiny, and she has become acquainted with an organization called the Rosicrucians. I said, what's that? She said, I haven't a clue. Hmm. But she said, why don't we get together for dinner, and you can talk to her. I bet you she can help you. As it turned out, I ended up going to my friend's home, meeting with Tiny, shared with her exactly, on all of its details, the dream experiences that I was having. And what occurred is that Tiny said to me, I haven't a clue about how to help you. However, I have this neighbor. And I always smile when I think about that patterning because so many times when it is time for a breakthrough in our lives, that reaching out to others eventually gets us to where we need to be if we keep asking for help and if we're open. Mm -hmm. And as it turned out, it was a very, very stormy night in Southern California. It was raining. It was lightning. It was thunder. It's sort of something like you'd expect with special effects in a a soap opera. But in all seriousness, what occurred was that I called Gloria. I introduced myself, and I was so frightened. I was just just shaking when I was on the phone with her. Hmm. I said, I am having these dreams. I don't know what to do. Can you help me? And she said, of course I can. In that moment, my life changed. She took my dreams apart. Hmm. She explained to me what the colors were in the dreams, what the images were in the dreams, what they meant, and why it was so significant. She said to me, she said, Donna, you are afraid that your life is in danger, but she said what it really is is that you have people that do not want you to change, but you're totally safe. You're going to go through this transition. Your life is going to be entering into a whole new territory. That was the very first conversation that I had with Gloria, who became a mentor. I knew her for two years before she passed away at the very youthful age of 38. Wow. In her, and I felt she passed her mantle to me. She was someone that was very deeply versed in astrology. And she told me so many years ago, She said, Donna, this work, the psychic area, is what you are going to find is your life's work. Well, when you're in your early 20s, in my personal opinion, I think most of us are brain dead. We just don't know. We we just don't have enough life experience to really get what we need to get. Mm -hmm. However, her words of wisdom were so, so powerful And she looked at me, she said, you are going to accomplish everything I would love to do. And she said, I cannot do it in this physical body. And there came that day, later on, two years later, where she left this experience and she left by choice. Mm -hmm. But getting back to where I was, that began a journey. That began a journey that introduced me to people that were transmediums people that were quote-unquote psychics, that worked with crystals, that worked with animals, that did all kinds of different expressions of mental disciplines. That's how I like to describe it. And I just felt 
like I was an odd duck. I, I just could not understand why this was so significant, what it was that I was supposed to do. My skills are especially keen in the areas of communication. He said to me, you are going to be able to teach people to show them that this, that at this time is considered something that is woo-woo, something that is abnormal, is going to become the norm. And Mm. You're going to be the communicator with this. And that's exactly how my life evolved in, in a million years. In a million years. I would never have imagined that I would have been as deeply involved in broadcasting as I have been both in radio and television. Right. And I, I just, it just wasn't there. This is, you know, I'm an individual. When I was in high school, I was called blood and guts. Because in biology, I was the first one to volunteer to do surgery on cow eyeballs and other things. So I got that <laughs> nickname when I was a sophomore in high school. And mm-hmm. it stuck. And I look at that. And I look at so many things that I thought I had planned out. And my life flipped from that moment on. So, and Donna, what, I'm just curious. What were your beliefs before these dreams happened to you that... What were, you, what, were you, what were you thinking that your life was going to go like, or what did you attribute the dreams to? Stay with us. We'll be right back. Hey there, something I want to tell you about today. My podcast platform, Buzzsprout, has recently made it easier for me to allow you to support me financially. Go to www.grieftogrowth.com slash subscribe. That's grief the number two growth.com slash subscribe. And once you're there, you can sign up to support me financially. Now, you can do it for as little as $3 a month or, of course, as much as you'd like. If you do that, you'll get access to bonus episodes. And you'll see those in the regular feed. They'll have a lock on them. But when you become a subscriber, you'll actually get access to your own private feed. And you'll be able to listen to the regular podcast along with the bonus podcast for the subscribers. I want to thank you for listening. I want to thank you for sharing the podcast. And I want to thank those of you who support me financially. Have a great day and on to the episode. I don't know what I could answer in a a quick summation for that. When you asked me about what my traditional beliefs were, Mm -hmm. I was raised in a Catholic Lutheran type of a religious environment. Mm -hmm. Okay. And I... You know, I went through catechism, I went through all kinds of things, but I always felt sort of disassociated from it. Yeah. I loved the stories in the Bible. I never was interested in the history. I always loved the stories, the parables. To me, they were so rich. I just loved them. To this day, I love stories, and that's why I love doing what I do. Mm -hmm. But when I look at the belief systems, it is almost as if, I came into this life experience, into an environment that allowed me, even at a young age, to be in situations with different cultures. Yeah. I come from an Italian-German background. So you have those composites of belief systems. My father was from Italy. He immigrated over here. And when when you have these different composites, I call myself a Heinz 57. Mm-hmm. And this is something I think that played into it. But there was always, even when I was growing up, this feeling of disassociation. A lot of the attitudes about people and, and cultures and things that were said. I can remember sort of going along with what people said, but it didn't make sense to me. Right. And I just realized I came in, and I I would say it's been, and I think especially in the last, to 15 years or so, where I have become aware that all of my life experiences have enabled me to reach this point Mm -hmm. of communication capability with other people, no matter what their ethnicity is. And it's just, uh, or, you know, the culture doesn't make any difference. We're all part of this human family. And when I think of how my journey began and what my mentor, how she perceived me, I could not see myself. How many of us can when we're in our 20s? We yeah. Can. We yeah. Can. 
You know, it's it's interesting that as you as you're telling that your background, I, I could just, I could so resonate with it. And it seems like so many people I talk to that are kind of on the the path that you and I seem to be on. It's like we we come in and we we're in these we're taught these traditional things, but they never quite sit right with us. Um, and then there's that event that kind of breaks us open. Yes, yes, very well said. Yes, and it's. Often an event, and then it's followed by another event, and then another event. And I, when I look back, it's almost as if there's a choreography, Mm -hmm. as if it was important for me to go through various experiences. And in hindsight, I can see that. Did I like it? Of course not. Most of us don't like being in boot camp. And that's what this life of schooling, and I call it that, is because we are here to learn. We're, we're here to learn, we're to grow, we're to expand, and we're to share. We are to be open and communicative with people about what we find is the truth. And it, I, it fascinates me. It really, really fascinates me how, let's say, 20, 30 years ago, to be able to talk with the openness that we're talking with now. In media, it was a no-no. You just didn't discuss things like this. Mm -hmm. Yet people were so hungry for it, regardless of what their belief systems were. They could identify with it. And look at where we are today, where science is catching up with the spiritual side of life. And I'm getting all kinds of commentary and I have for 20 years, almost 20 years that I've been doing my programming. And I find the evolution so amazing, so absolutely amazing. And look at how the technology has evolved so that we can communicate. I mean, you talk with people in Europe. I talk with people in Europe and different parts of the world. It is absolutely thrilling where we've evolved to. I just think it's great. Oh, I think it, it it is thrilling, and um, you know the fact that, as you said, we can we can when when maybe a generation before us or a couple of generations back, you kind of hung out with people of your own, you know, religion, your own culture, your own race, whatever. And now we can reach out to people literally all over the world, different cultures, different religions, different races, uh, and then the, the way that science, as you said, is kind of catching up with what we've been taught spiritually. It is all, it's just, it's fascinating to, to watch as it unfolds. Um, so I think that's, you know, I think you made a really good point there. And when you talked earlier also about, you know, this life kind of being like a boot camp, I think, at least for me, that was a pretty new uh, revelation that I only, I only found out about, like, say, maybe five years ago, that, you know, we're actually here to learn. And it puts a whole different perspective on some of the difficulties that we go through. I concur. Now, Anybody that says that they, you know, another person, when they hear a comment like that, they, so many people will say, oh, I guess it's someone's karma that they have to go through this. They must have been a lousy person in their life because look at how they're suffering. Mm -hmm. No, that's not the case at all. Sometimes we come into this experience because we need to understand something. And in our world, in our physical world, world. We need to do it. For example, if you want a drink of water and you're sitting at a table, now you haven't gotten to the point where you're an ex ex man or ex woman, as it's so often portrayed in Marvel comics, where you can say, okay, faucet, you bring your water and put it over in my glass. Thank you very much. No, you have to get up out of your chair. You have to walk over to that sink and you have to turn that faucet on. Now, if that faucet is not connected, you're not going to get any water. So you have to physically have a system in place so that you get that demonstration of water coming out of the faucet, going into the glass or cup that you want filled. Mm -hmm. And that's the way the lessons of life are. We need to go through the actual physical experiences many times. And we need to understand how important our choices are. That is that is absolutely phenomenal, absolutely phenomenal. And a lot of times it's very difficult for us to get that message. Lots of times it's very tough for us to get that. So we have to go through 
are aches and pains and different things. And I have yet to interview a person on my program or even in conversation that has not gone through a dark night of the soul on one level or another. And they'll go, it doesn't make sense. I'm really a good person. It doesn't mean you're not a good person when you go through these experiences. It's merely time to grow again. And I know that sounds simplistic, but I mean it most sincerely. Oh, you're absolutely right. And I've I've had the same experience as I've interviewed people on my programs, the people that have done the most growth, who've done the most work of themselves, who have really, you know, I guess, uh, gotten some richness of understanding. They've all been through, as you said, this this dark night of the soul or, or multiples. And, you know, sometimes I'll be interviewing people and I'm just fascinated by the fact that they're still, you know, they're still around because they've been through the most difficult circumstances. But it's really in, in how you view the circumstances and how you can use those to propel yourself forward that's the key to to getting through this life. I agree. It. I think so many times that is what my skills in my psychic work, when I'm working with people, I tell them this is a tool. When I'm in a session with people, I said, you need to understand I'm an information resource. Mm -hmm. When I get information for you, it does not mean you have no choice in your life. It means that you must be aware of what is evolving around you. And hopefully you can deal with things with a a deeper sense of understanding and wisdom. It is a process. And I have yet to find a shortcut. I know there's a lot of people that will promote shortcuts, but I have yet to find one. And if you notice any of the films that are out about the heroes, the heroines, uh, I don't care if it's a war story, whatever, there is always this arduous journey that the hero has to go through, or heroine, to be able to gain wisdom, to be able to discern things as they need to be discerned. And it doesn't make any difference what your age is. Yeah. You can go that process at any age. You can do it when you're eight years old or when you're 109. It doesn't make any difference. Yeah, you know, that's a really interesting observation you made about the hero's journey because uh, that is the arc of every every story, every movie, every book. And, and there's a reason for that. Because it, I mean, some people consider it mythological, but as we were saying, you can see that in, in people's lives. We all go through that hero's journey as we go through as we go through this life. And it's just... There's something about being human that seems to require that. Stay with us. We'll be right back. Hi there. I'm really excited to tell you about my latest ebook. It's four lessons that you can learn from the near-death experience without going through all the trouble of dying to learn them. I've been studying NDEs for several years now. I am completely convinced that not only are they 100% real, but that there's some very universal wisdom that we can get from the near-death experience. And I've distilled that down in this book into four short lessons. And I've also given you all the reasons why I believe the NDEs are absolutely real. So go to www.grieftogrowth.com slash NDE lessons to pick it up for free www.grief the number two growth.com slash NDE lessons. I hope you enjoy it. Well, as I said, I look back on my own life and that's why I will tell people all of us are pretty much brain dead when we're in our early twenties. There might be a tiny minority that isn't. Mm -hmm. And again, it's because of a lack of life experience. If you do not have an environment, that enables you to see different perspectives, how are you going to know otherwise? You're not. That is why throughout history, and I love to study history, throughout history, those individuals, whether it's in the past or in the present and even in the future, those individuals that wish to have dominion over others always, I don't care, male, female, doesn't make any difference, They always, first of all, do not want you to think. When you get into the study of, I'll say, metaphysics, when you get into the understanding that there is a purpose for critical thinking, but that has to go along with the wisdom of the, what I call the 
gatekeeper or the wisdom holder within a person, you must understand different things. Otherwise, your decisions are just not going to be clear. You're not going to know how to accept anything out of the norm. You're going to fight it. You're going to think it's your enemy. You are not encouraged to think. You are encouraged to follow a regimen, an orientation. And this is where, when I became involved in the psychic area, Mm -hmm. it wasn't about readings, per se, having someone tell me what my future was. That wasn't it. What it was about was empowering me with an understanding that you have to walk the walk of learning. You have to pick and choose who you're going to keep company with. You have to be open to different perspectives, different understandings, so that you can develop that innate wisdom that you have within yourself. Mm -hmm. And this is where cultural diversity and looking at different environments of how people can live their lives by choice or not by choice, it enriches you. And it makes you aware that you have a power within yourself that if you're discerning, you can have a very rich, full life that engages you with other people, that empowers you to serve, if you will, in your life experience in a way and manner that you maybe could never have imagined otherwise. But it takes walking the path of life and engaging in it. The good, the bad, the ugly, all of it's there, but it's there for a reason. I find it extremely fascinating. Yeah, it's, you know, I guess once we have that, once we've had some life experiences, we can have that perspective. Uh, I think it was Kierkegaard that said that, you know, life can only be understood backwards, but it must be lived forward. So as we're going through these things, and I think about, I have a 23-year-old, you know, daughter. And uh, you talk about being in your early 20s, and she, frankly, I think she's wise beyond her years. But, you know, it's as as you get, as we have some of the experience and we can look back, we can kind of put some perspective on it. And we can start to see that that thing I thought was going to destroy me, you know, actually made me stronger. Um, and, and, it, and it actually not really even made me stronger, but it brought forth this inner strength that was always there that I didn't know that I had. But we would never know we had it unless we were tested. Very true. And the experience with your daughter, all of what you have gained and what your family has gained. And look at what you're able to do today because you're able to interact with other people and support them, allow them to be in their space with whatever experiences they may have had with a loved one. And they're able to be who they are, and you can accept them for who they are, but you're there if they need someone to talk to and to share with them that they're not alone. Mm -hmm. I think that is one of the biggest obstacles that I had to overcome was the feeling, I am all alone. Mm -hmm. There's nobody that's going to understand what I've been through. Or we have this feeling of shame because of maybe what we have done in our life. And we we wear it like a, a suit of, of Kevlar. Mm-hmm. And it's reinforced with steel. And we don't want anybody to get into our space because we just are not worthy. My goodness, I've walked that route too. Yeah. And the truth is, when you're honest about who you are, what you've been through, you're going to find a, thousand, find a thousand and one people saying, oh, my goodness, let me tell you my story. Thank you for being so honest, for being so open. Yeah. Because I can empathize with what you're saying. I just I feel like I've been liberated because you've shared your story. That That, that is that's powerful. That is so true. That That is just I find that to be so true. And after my daughter passed away, which was, you know, five years ago and for those who may not know, my daughter was 15 years old and passed away suddenly uh, in 2015. But I started sharing with people, you know, my personal experiences after that, the good, the bad and the ugly. And, and frankly, one of the reasons I wrote my book is because I wanted people to not feel alone on the grief journey, because we all have such you know, being a human is unique, but it's also universal. And there are only so many emotions you can experience. And we all experience the same emotions. 
but we we tend to hold them in, especially in this culture. And we say, well, I don't want to appear weak and I don't want people to think I'm crazy because I had this thought or I had that thought. But once you once you crack that shell and you open it up and you start sharing it with people, just as you said, Donna, people are like, wow, I felt the exact same way or I had a very similar experience. Absolutely true. When I am speaking publicly, when I'm in with other people, I feel so fortunate to be in the work that I'm in because it gives people an opportunity to understand just what I've emphasized. One, we're not alone. Two, that there is a value and a purpose to their lives. They may not discern it as I can discern it, just like my my mentor discerned things about me Mm -hmm. that I could not see because we don't know how to look at ourselves objectively. We we just don't. We we are living in our in our beingness and we don't know how to stand away. Mm-hmm. Because if we do, sometimes we have a perception that we're being arrogant if we talk well about our skills or we emphasize certain things. And that's not arrogance. That is not being narcissistic. It is honoring and respecting those strengths that we have, and then also also honoring and respecting our weaknesses as well, mm-hmm. because we're always a work in progress. But when you are able to be with someone where you have that empathy, where there is that compassion, where there is that honesty and that integrity, that is more valuable than all of the gold in the world. Yes. Because then you recognize that you're here for a purpose, and your purpose is to be the best you possibly can be. Being rich and famous isn't it. You are, as some people like to say, a light worker. And I often, at the end of my show, will tell people, turn on your light, keep that light on, don't let that light go out, because you make a difference. We don't realize how, as individuals, when we're true to ourselves, when we have that compassion, when we have that understanding, I don't care if you're a Navy SEAL or you're a grandma just taking care of your grandkids and you say, oh, I'm insignificant. All I'm doing is taking care of you know, my grandchildren. Mm-hmm. It's not the issue. The issue is whatever your talents, whatever your skills are, when you give them and you give them with an openness and integrity, and you share your stories, and you pass them on, you are empowering those people around you, no matter what age they might be. You never know what someone else is going through. And you tell your story, you may actually find that you're a healer in a way and manner you could never have imagined. Life is is absolutely a phenomenal experience. It's really a gift. No matter how dark, no matter how ugly it is, it, and that is why often we go through these experiences because we've got a job to do. Mm-hmm. We have to be tempered, just like steel has to be tempered. Yeah. You know, I think the Japanese sword, there's a particular sword. I don't recall if it's a samurai sword or what it is, but there was a tradition. You really had to earn that sword. And if you were given the opportunity to have that sword made, the maker of the sword would have to heat that steel, fold it, and heat it again. And it was put into the fire so many times, maybe a thousand times. There was a, a, an astronomical number of times mm-hmm. that that steel had to be reheated, re-sculpted, pounded, then put in the fire again. And it was done over and over and over again. That steel, though was so strong after all of that tempering, heating, pounding, that it was considered to be almost godlike in, mm-hmm. its, in its strength. This is what I think is a fabulous example of what often as human beings we go through. Yeah, and I, I want to just kind of emphasize something you said earlier, though. We, we, I think, again, you talked about like knowing our own inner strength and admitting that we have skills and talent. And that that almost seems to be like something that from from my background, and I think so, so you had a fairly traditional Christian background growing up, that we were taught 
to not really to to acknowledge our inner strength, to, to kind of be ashamed of ourselves and see ourselves as weak. And you know, speaking for myself, um, you know, you mentioned the word light worker, and I saw a, a meme a few weeks or a couple of months ago about you know light workers, and I'm like, well, am I a light worker? I, I like to think I'm a light worker, but yeah, I can't say I'm a light worker because that wouldn't be being humble. Um, and I think we I think we've we don't want to acknowledge our own strength, our own magnificent magnificence that we all have. I mean, we're all incredibly magnificent, but we're scared to say that. Very true. And you look at many doctrines that have been passed along. As I said earlier, whenever you want to have dominion over a person, over an environment, it could be over a nation. Mm -hmm. The last thing you want people to do, if you wish to dominate, is to encourage them to think. And I really, there have been so many conversations I've had with people that have gone through having to learn to think for themselves. And I think one of the more, well, I will call it a very sad story. It's about Jim Jones. And all of us perhaps are familiar with him. He's the guy that ends up developing this group, and he goes out of the country. He ends up forcing people to commit suicide, men, women, and children. Mm -hmm. And then he himself, you know, checks out. And I will never forget, I was up in Anchorage, Alaska on a business trip, and I happened to open up the local newspaper. This is many years ago. And there was a commentary in there about a father. This man had become a member. He and his wife both, and his wife was pregnant at the time. He and his wife both had become a part of the Jim, the Jim Jones cult. And he was absolutely 100% committed. Anything that was said to him that he had to do, he did. Now, his wife, after she gave birth to her child, the patterning was within the church was to take away the children from the mothers. And... Mm -hmm was seeing this happening, and she appealed to her husband, begging him to leave the group. She said, we are not going to be able to have our child. We've, I just don't want to give up my baby boy. And he fought against her. Well, she ended up leaving the group. He stayed. And the child stayed with him. This man was quite wealthy and was pretty much able to take the child away from the mother. Wow. So what evolved is that when Jim Jones went out of the country, afterwards, there was a survivor, found the father, and said to him, I managed to escape, but I have to tell you something. Your son was the first child that was given the poison. Mm -hmm. And your child was begging to live. Mm -hmm. Now, that father, in this commentary, in this article, he said, to my dying day, I will deeply regret that I did not listen to my wife and to find out that my son begged for his life and he was just a little guy, mm -hmm. but he knew he wanted to live. And to be told that, he said, I am paying a very, very heavy price for that. Yeah. And that is something that is a very dark story. But it emphasizes in my mind that we must always be willing to learn and to think and to really not be afraid to question. And when there is someone or a group or an environment that says you do not have the right to be the individual you are, you follow this edict or you're out. We need to be able to think about that. We need to ask ourselves, why is it that they make this kind of a controlling comment? And also, what is it that they're after? Yeah, that's and, that's a really extreme example of what happens when we give up our power. And as, as you were saying, yeah. I thought about the phrase drinking the Kool-Aid. And younger people may not know where that phrase came from, but it came from that that event in Jonestown where he literally put poison in the Kool-Aid and gave it to the people and they willingly drank the Kool-Aid. They given up their power so much that they gave up their lives for a madman. 
Um, and, and we all, that's just a microcosm. You know, it's one of those lessons that we can learn from. That's what happens when we don't think for ourselves. Yes. And I think that being in the work that I've been in, I realize, and I have said this to many people, that when they discover their own skills, their own abilities, I always say to them, honor and respect what you have and know that you are going to be able to express yourself in your own way. It's not superior to anybody else's. It's just you. However, your talents are going to be displayed. But remember, you never stop learning. Mm -hmm. And if you expose yourself to different environments of thinking and people's perceptions, that is going to empower you because you're going to be able to be more discerning about what suits you and what doesn't. Yeah, absolutely. And I think uh, that's another thing. You know, we all have something important to say. We all have important talents. And you talked earlier about, you know, our life's purpose. And so sometimes when people hear these things about, well, these lessons are here to teach us and maybe we have a life plan. And then people will say, well, what's what's my purpose? You know, it, it's got to be something really big. And when I'm when I'm counseling people, coaching people, I tell them your purpose could be something as simple as uh, as being a mother or being a father. Or, mm -hmm. you know, being a good example, I talk to grieving parents and I'm like, just by the fact that you're continuing to live on this earth after you've lost a child, you're an example to somebody. So you don't have to look for something, you know, you don't have to literally go out and change the world as we think it means to be a celebrity, but you can change the world one person at a time and you, and you can have a much bigger impact than you maybe think you have. Oh, I agree. I had the very good fortune a number of years ago to interview a woman who was in her 80s. Now, this woman, if you were to talk to her, you would think, oh, well, she's in her 80s. What is it that she possibly could share with me? This is a woman that had witnessed a lot of tragedy in her life. This is a woman that has absolutely no real income. She's in her 80s. Mm -hmm. And she lives, however, in a very nice condominium. She made up her mind a number of years ago, in fact, for 30 years of her life. She was in a positioning where she worked with people that were coming off the street, the homeless. Mm -hmm. She worked with them, nondescript personality, always was in a situation involving a challenge with money. She was barely able to keep herself off the street, but she still was out there doing some work. The irony is that she was involved with a church, and this one day there was this service, and she was being recognized for the work in the community. And one of the members of the congregation had gifted her with a beautiful condo that she could live in for the rest of her life, and she had everything she needed. She said, I'm always provided for somehow. But then there was someone in the audience that stood up and said, I want you to know that you have made such a difference in my life. And a number of years earlier, maybe 15 years before this particular event that went on in this church happened, she had met up with a young woman. This young woman was in a very confused state. She was an unwed mother. She was going through all kinds of negative situations. And this woman helped her get off the street, helped her to understand how important her education was, put her in touch with some people that could assist her. And that person stood up and said, I want to give you recognition, honor you, and respect you. I want you to meet my son mm -hmm. that you helped me save. And you helped me save my life, showed me how I could make a choice. There were tears in the eyes of everybody in the congregation. Yeah. This woman had no idea that this younger woman sitting in the audience with her son, who now was a young man, made all the difference in the world. Just that one person. But she mm -hmm. touched the lives of many. Mm -hmm. A 
bless her spirit. I don't know if she's still with us or not. This was, I call it, like to call her the grandma in Arkansas. Yeah, yeah. I love that. I love that story. And, and it, it reminds me, I, um, I've studied near-death experiences quite a bit. And when people have their life review, uh, oftentimes it's, it's these little, what we call little things that they do that make a huge impact on people that, that we kind of tend to undervalue here because we think it's got to be the, quote, big things that make a difference. But it could be, it could be a kind word to a stranger. It could be smiling to someone. It could be, you know, just it could be anything that that, that that just makes someone's day a little bit brighter that you don't know what kind of impact you might have. So um, as long as you're you're here and you're living and you're breathing, you've got a purpose to serve. I agree. I agree 100 percent. And what often is called the paranormal to me is very normal. Mm-hmm. And when I say that. I think we need to be open to the awareness that life has a magic to it. And we need to sometimes make a point of being around little kids so that we can really understand how they can relate to this magic. And you find it in nature. You can find it in the grocery store. You can find it in so many places, and it's when you acknowledge that magic, the coincidences, the synchronicity. It's it's something that just really makes you aware that you're not here just as a blob of whatever. Mm-hmm. No, you are an essence that is a part of a something so great and so magnificent and you may think you're nothing bigger than a nano dot, which I know I felt many times. I go, gee whiz, what's the big deal? I mean, there's over 7 billion people on this planet, and I don't know what else is out in the universe. Why right. am I significant? Right. I'm sure you've had the same feeling. Absolutely. It is a big deal. Because as I read once a commentary by a woman whose mother had challenged her with a piece of paper that had a bunch of dots on it, and she asked the daughter, she said, because the daughter was going through a lot of agitation, her teenage years, just couldn't make sense of things. Life was not fair. All of this stuff that we so often express. Her mother hands her this paper with a bunch of dots on it. She said, what do you see? She said, I just see a bunch of dots. And her mom said, can you discern what is there? And she said, no, mom, I can't figure this out. It's just a whole bunch of dots on a piece of paper. She handed her daughter a pencil. She said, I want you to connect the dots and then tell me what you see. And she did that. And she said, well, mom, this is what it is. And she told her what the picture is. Mm -hmm. She said, dear, that's what life is. It's connecting the dots. And sometimes you're not going to be able to see the bigger picture. But the universe does. Yeah. Well, I think, you know, I I love what you said about the world being a magical place. Um, My background, I'm an engineer. My, My background is chemical engineering. So I'm very, you know, I have this very mechanistic view, I guess you could say, of things. And as you said, you know, we've got the supernatural and the natural. And I've always thought what the supernatural is, you know, maybe not provable. But the more that I understand, the more that I study, everything is natural, first of all. What we call supernatural, we just don't understand yet. And this world is a magical place. It really is. And it's really weird. The older I get, the more that I see that. I just think the magic is so amazing. I see it in programming. I've had people tell me, oh, television is terrible. No, it's not. You choose what you want to watch. Exactly. And you discern. Sometimes you will find yourself gravitating towards a program. You don't know why. You watch the program and you go through the experiences that maybe is that are being portrayed and you realize you've been given a gift. You've mm-hmm. been given a perspective that you did not know was there. And you are given the process of opportunity to think about what you have seen. And you may not have to go through perhaps some of the negative experiences that might be in a documentary that you look at. But maybe it gives you an awareness of how we have to be mindful of our interactions as human beings with other human beings. Yeah. Just because someone else did something stupid, horrifically brutal, whatever, doesn't mean we have to do it. But we have to make that choice. And if you don't know what your options are in life, 
if you have only been encased within a certain aspect of thinking, how can you possibly be able to step out of that little tiny box? How are you going to know how to take the lid off of your life that is so compartmentalized, not only knock the lid off, but knock the sides down, and even get rid of the foundation and say, wait a minute, I want to build something that's open, that's airy, Mm -hmm. that has many doors so I can have all kinds of opportunities come in. You want a lot of windows in your walls. You want to be sure that you can, if you choose not to look out the window, that's your choice. But you have this opportunity. And I can speak from experience as well as from, you know, just observation. Yeah. If you are not open to learning, if you're not open to reading, if you're not open to questioning, you will walk around with an attitude that is so dead in the water that you will agonize over why life is this, that, or the other. You will not know how you can be part of the solution. Yeah. All you will focus on is the problem. And we're going through situations right now where I have witnessed so many different conditions and people, how they respond to it. I've witnessed fear that is so thick, you could cut it with a knife. Yes. You, I witnessed attitudes of paralyzed thinking. Wait a minute. We have had someone give a verdict. Look at how they're changing their words. Look at how they're saying, well, this wasn't the right thing to say, or that wasn't the right thing to say. We're in unknown territory. But it's nothing new. It's been around before. Yes. And it's it's really fascinating, but this is what life is about. We are challenged to see how we're going to grow. And I think we have been given a fabulous opportunity here. We all kick like a bunch of mules, and that's not unusual either. Right. But I think we're very blessed. I really, really do. Yeah, we've talked about this on a on a microcosm level. I think let's maybe it's time to expand that to the to the macrocosm because I think that life does bring us lessons and we do come here, we we kind of for whatever reason we forget who we are while we're here until life somehow wakes us up with these little lessons which seem to come bigger and bigger until we finally acknowledge them. And I as and you and I talked about this earlier before we got on the air, there's I think there's an opportunity in what we're going through right now with the coronavirus, and I think there's some lessons for us to be learned. Uh, some people are looking at, say, is this a punishment like we do individually? You know, what did we do wrong? Um, I don't think it's necessarily. I don't think it's a punishment. I don't think it's what we did wrong. I think it's what it's what we can learn from it. I concur. The coronavirus is nothing new. It has been on this planet ever since people have been on this planet. Mm -hmm. It is a life form. People will say, oh, it's dead. Well, I guarantee you, if it's dead, it's not going to want to take advantage of its human host. It has to have a host to feed on. Mm -hmm. Now, that sounds a little gross. But hey, for those of you that watch the voodoo, hoodoos, you know, the vampires and all this other stuff, what it is, it is a life form that we really don't understand. And we look at it as an enemy. So we have the opportunity to be able to find out more about this life form and what we can do so that we don't end up being its lunch. And I know that sounds a little bit tacky, but I'm serious. Mm -hmm. This is life. You study nature. You have fungi. You have bacteria. You can have farmers that will lose an entire crop because of a fungal invasion. Mm Mm-hmm. You have trees that are attacked by parasites. Yes. And we will have entire forests wiped out. We are part of this package of life. Yes. We are in an opportune positioning to learn how to understand different aspects of life so that we can become stronger, not weaker, but stronger. And it's very difficult when you're seeing and hearing the, I call it propaganda and information that's out there, that makes you afraid. And you need to be able to understand that you may, you may not have a capacity 
to understand this invader of our space, Mm -hmm. but it doesn't hit everybody. It doesn't, it's, it's something, it's just like nature. I remember having a mentor, Dr. Uh, not, it's Reverend Humble was his name. And he said that as an Illinois farm boy, and he grew up during an era where they didn't have electricity. He said, what too many people don't understand is that you have to learn how to work with nature. Yes. Not against her, but with her. And when you do that, There is a harmony that reigns. When you don't do that, there's disharmony. And Mother Nature has to contend with that herself. She has to deal with that every single moment of the day. Yeah. You know, the thing is about this, um, as as you were saying, we're just kind of touching on, there are, I think, some lessons to be learned here. But the, the bigger thing is, and we started off with this, life is about lessons. And even if you don't understand the lesson necessarily while you're going through it, and when you're going through the storm, it's hard to appreciate the fact that it's there to teach you a lesson. But if you can just hold on to the perspective that there is a lesson and I don't understand it yet, then that that in itself will help you endure. I agree. I think we underestimate our capability. Yes. And it's so easy to get into a victim mentality of poor me. Oh my goodness. Why is God mad at me? I'm, I'm a good person. Why should these things happen to me? Well, life happens and it's not good. It's not bad. It's how you are going to deal with it. How are you going to leverage what your experiences are? How are you going to leverage these experiences so that you become a brighter light in this world, so that you take your talents and your abilities and put them into a positioning where they stand so strongly that somebody walks up to you and will say, I want to know about you. I want what you've got. And you'll have the delightful opportunity of saying, I'll be happy to share my story but you're going to have to create your own story and you're going to be the one that has to do the work. I cannot do it for you. Yeah. Yeah. Donna, um, before we end, I do want to talk to you about your shows, uh, the Donna Sebo show and warriors for peace. So tell me about the work that you're doing now. I have entered into my 19th year with my programming. The Donna Sebo show is on from Monday through Friday, mm-hmm. eight to 9 PM Pacific time. And that is a very eclectic program. I have people from all over the world that we have topics about food. We have topics about spirituality and personal empowerment is my theme. Mm -hmm. And every guest that I have, like yourself, has something specific to share. And we have conversation. And then I open up the second half of the hour to phone calls so people can call in and chat with me directly if they like to, and then I share. Uh, when I don't have phone calls, then I share whatever is the latest in medical information, industrial information, et cetera. It's very eclectic. Mm-hmm. Warriors for Peace is done every Wednesday from 7 to 8 p.m. And Warriors for Peace is primarily focused on how an hour conversation with individuals from various aspects of life that have something to give us in the way of historical information that can empower our levels of knowledge, personal experiences, but they are individuals that are working for peace in their own way. And there are so many different types of wars that go on in life. And whenever we can have the opportunities to have engaging conversation, maybe about history, what happened in the past history, what we can learn from history, and more. We realize then that we have something to look forward to. So I do six shows a week. Wow, you're busy. <laughs> yes, sir. Donna, uh, yeah, I, I, I had the opportunity to be on your show. It, it was a pleasure to be on your show. It's a pleasure to meet you and have you on, on my show and to share your your wisdom with people. Uh, I think this is a very opportune time to have this conversation as we're going through as we're all going through something that's very difficult. Um, Any last words you want to say before we close out today? 
Yes. What I would like to say is if people would like to find out more about the programming, they could go to my website, delphiinternational.com. That's D-E-L-P-H-I, international.com. Also, I have another website, Mrs. Sebo's Classics. And Sebo is spelled S like Sam, two E's like Edward, B like boy, O. Mm -hmm. Mrs. Sebo's Classics. Dot com And there I have my publications, my award-winning children's book, my development program for intuitive abilities, mind magic, and also the miracle of eight penny. Oh, wow. You can find out the information on Amazon as well. The children's books are there. So you can go in and, and look at it. You can even listen to some of the audio books if you want. There's little clips there. But more than anything else, I really so appreciate this opportunity with you, Brian. Because you, along with myself and so many others that have the opportunity due to the technologies of today, we're able to share with people not just hope, but an awareness that they have a value in life. And for those of you that are listening to this broadcast, I want you to know one thing. You are significant. You have a job to do. And I consider it an extreme privilege and also a pleasure to have had this time to be able to share a few thoughts with you. And I encourage you to keep on learning, keep on being the best you can be, because you're the master of your fate and you are the captain of your soul. God wow. Bless. Wow. Thank you, Donna. I'm going to let it go with that. It was great to talk to you and uh, you have a wonderful day and you be blessed. Thank you. Well, I hope you enjoyed the episode. I want to make it really easy for you to reach me. So just send me a text to 31996 and simply text the word growth, G-R-O-W-T-H. In fact, you can right now just say, hey, Siri, send a message to 31996. And when Siri asks you what you want to send, just say growth. You can do the same thing with OK Google. Thanks a lot. Have a wonderful day. Thanks for listening to Grief to Growth. Brian hopes that you find this episode helpful and will come back for future episodes. Brian's best-selling book, Grief to Growth, Planted Not Buried, is a great resource for anyone who is coping with grief or knows someone who is. If you enjoy the podcast and would like to support it, there are three things you can do to help. The first is to share the podcast with someone that you think it will help. The second is to go to iTunes, rate, and review the episode. The third way you can support the podcast is by becoming a patron. Head over to www.patreon.com slash grief to growth. That's patreo dot com slash grief, the number two, growth, and sign up to make a small monthly donation. Patrons get access to exclusive bonus content and knowledge that you are helping to spread the message of grief to growth. For more about Brian and grief to growth, Visit www.grief2growth.com. Hi there. I hope you enjoyed this latest episode of the podcast, and I'd love to hear your thoughts. What questions came up for you? What did you like about it? What didn't you like about it? I invite you to visit us at grief2growth.circle.so. That's grief2growth.circle.so to continue the conversation with me and with other listeners. It's a space to sound off to share reactions, and to go deeper into the topics from the show. I look forward to chatting more, and I hope to see you there.